Good, good. Thanks for being out here. Um, we're going to get started here. We'll, we'll have a word of prayer, but a couple of things really, really, really important that we that we do for um, for, for this this evening. First of all, this is being live streamed, and it's uh, it's going on not only our YouTube channel, but it's also on Frank Turek's Cross Examine. So there will be a number of people online, and if you're online or if you're here, <clears throat> the best way to ask questions is to go on your phone to reachnextgen.com and you'll see at the top, it'll say you can ask a question. You don't have to give any information. You can just type in your name. If you don't wanna put your name in, that's fine. Um, but we'd like to have your name so at least we can say, hey, and you can make up a name if you want. Um, and then you can ask your question and we're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, we, we might not be able to get all of them, but uh, we, we will do our best. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is that um, I, I believe a church that is unwilling to answer the tough questions or allow space for people to ask the tough questions um, is, is not doing a very good job of, of what we're called to do. We should be able to give answers. Um, some answers are more complex. Some answers are, are, there's you know various opinions on certain things, but we wanna have space where people can ask difficult questions and where they feel like they are welcome. So skeptics and non-believers are always welcome here at Grace. And if you're online or watching, you know, please know that we would love to have you ask some questions as well. And you can send those questions to reachnextgen.com. So that being said, why don't we start off with a word of prayer and then we'll get uh, um, Frank Turek out here and he will do a great job of uh, answering some questions. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, <clears throat> for your mercy, and for your kindness. And we just ask that this evening that you would... Uh, take what we're doing here, and, and I pray for a couple of groups of people. Um, when I pray for those Christians who maybe have some questions or struggling with things or um, just are not sure about certain things, I pray that maybe they would get some answers this, uh, this evening that help them in their, in their Christianity, that help them, Lord, in their, uh, in their walk with you. I pray also for those that might be skeptical or um, maybe aren't sure about Christianity. Um, I pray that there would be some answers this evening that might help them to better understand what Christianity is all about and ultimately to make a decision to become a Christian. So Lord, we give you tonight, we ask that you would take it and use it for your glory and for your glory alone. And we pray all of these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. And uh, everybody said, amen, right? So. Would you, if you could, please, um, I would appreciate it, could we give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Frank Turek. Thanks, brother. Thanks for being here. Here's your mic on. I got it on. Okay, And I good. brought my Bible. Good. <laughs> so we, we've, got, we've got an hour and a half to do this, and we, we're, we're going to have a lot of questions. Um, again, if you have a question, reach nextgen.com. It says, ask question. Type in your name. You can make up a name. Send a question in. We're going to do our best to answer every single question that comes in, but we may have more than, more than we can, can do. So let's, let's start off. You ready for this one? This is from Stefan. Should women wear head coverings when praying, as discussed in 1 Corinthians 11, 5 and surrounding verses? I think we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as you know, theologians debate that, uh, Pastor Chip, yep. because they want to know if that's cultural or is it uh, universal. And uh, the teachings that I've seen on it is it's cultural, that it is not a universal command. I would like to get your input on that. Yeah, I think that uh, in, in Corinth, um, the, the, the head coverings were, were definitely cultural things because it, they when you didn't cover your head, it said something about you as a woman and um, it was looked down upon. And so mm -hmm. I think that where you run the risk though is, is once you say that that is a cultural thing, then you open up a lot of the Bible to it's become true. cultural. And those who hold to those opinions um, would say that. They would say, well, once you give in on that, then you gotta give in on all these other things. But I don't think that that's true. I do think that you know when Paul says to, uh, you know, that to bring his cloak and parchments, that doesn't mean that we need to bring cloak and parchments every time we go somewhere. You know, I think there's certain things in Scripture that are, that are that way, but uh, right, yeah, I, right. I would say cultural. Um, and in fact, uh, as you well know, in 1 Corinthians, it was a very sensual area. Yes. They had temple prostitution. It was sort of even more like the Las Vegas than Las Vegas is today. And so there were certain ways of trying to prevent the congregation from falling into that kind of permissive behavior, and that may have been one of them. 
Yeah, and I think that, you know, you, you got in 1 Corinthians 6, you have the, uh, the, the men are engaging in um, practices with the temple prostitutes, and Paul has to remind them that their body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, so yeah, we're, we're dealing with a, a lot of things there. And, mm-hmm. and, and to understand these epistles anyway, you have to have um, a good background of what's going on in those mm-hmm. books. Mm-hmm. But m- my feeling would be that, yeah, those are, that's a cultural mm-hmm. thing, and, mm-hmm. you know, so at Grace, we don't ask women to put something on their head. So let's, uh, let's, let's continue on here. We have another question from Dan. Um, great question. This is you. What is the best archaeological evidence for the existence of Jesus? Best archaeological evidence for the existence of Jesus. Well, I would say one piece of evidence regarding the, auth- the authentic nature of the crucifixion is an unbelievable discovery known as the Caiaphas ossuary. And I don't know if you know what an ossuary is, but it was a bone box, say about this big, about this tall, made out of limestone. And they found hundreds of these in the Holy Land. And from about 20 BC to about 70 AD, the Jews, after someone had died and been dead for a year, would go into the tomb and take the bones, the flesh is gone, they would take the bones and put it in this limestone box known as an ossuary. And then they would reinter the remains because they believed in a bodily resurrection at the end of time. And in 1990, uh, by accident, they discovered a tomb that had a number of ossuaries in it, and one of them was very ornate. And on the side of it, the inscription read, Joseph Caiaphas. Now, there's only one Caiaphas known from history, and it was the high priest who literally sentenced Jesus to die. This is the man who asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man coming with power on the clouds. And Caiaphas tore his robes and said, blasphemy. Do we need, did you hear what he said? You don't need to hear anymore. What should we do with him? We should crucify him. So not only do we know that Caiaphas existed, we have his bones. Because inside this bone box was an, uh, were bones of a 60-year-old man and his family, and this was discovered in 1990. So that's one of the more extreme uh, archaeological evidences of someone who actually knew Jesus and actually sentenced Jesus to die. And by the way, if you go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem now, you will see this ossuary. It's on a table, actually, and uh, there's no glass in front of it. It's just sitting there. Now, if you touched it, you'd probably be shot, but <laughs> I mean, it's just sitting there, and behind it is the famous, you may have heard, the, uh, the heel bone of the crucified victim, Johannan, who came from about 50 AD. They have a heel bone with a nail going through it, and the nail is bent, and this is the heel bone of a crucified victim found in Jerusalem, uh, and this heel bone dates to about 50 AD. So these are just two archaeological discoveries of the crucifixion of Jesus uh, found in Jerusalem. And there are others if I were to think about it, but those are the two of the more extreme ones. Does it, um, and I mean, <clears throat> doesn't Michael Icona believe that the Shroud of Turin is, is Jesus? I well, Gary was- Habermas, who is the top scholar in the world on the resurrection, he's written more than anybody else. His magnum opus is over 5,000 pages. He's editing it, editing it right now. Gary is also an expert on the Shroud of Turin. And if you ask Gary, do you think the Shroud of Turin is authentic? He would say, I'm 80% sure it is. Hmm. Uh, and he will give you some of the reasons for that. The, the Shroud of Turin is supposedly the burial cloth of Christ. And you may have heard, oh, they carbon dated that to the Middle Ages. Yeah, what they carbon dated was a piece of it that had been repaired in the Middle Ages due to a fire. Uh, The actual shroud itself has pollen on it from the first century, it appears, in Palestine. And it has some other features that appear to be authentic. To this day, they don't know how the image of Jesus or the crucified victim is on this particular piece of cloth. They can't figure out how it could have been put on there. It's not painted on there. There's blood on it. It's a, it's a very, very unique find. Yeah. 
Um, I typically don't use that as an argument for the, authentic, you know, for the authenticity of Jesus because there are better arguments, but it is very interesting. In fact, one of the things that Gary thought was interesting is that if, if you were to put a nail through the wrist, which is really probably where Jesus was crucified, uh, you would break some sort of nerve or bone or tendon or something which would cause the thumb to collapse. And if you look at the Shroud of Torah and his thumbs are not out, they're in. And uh, that's just one piece hmm. of evidence that this appears to be a real crucified victim Interesting. and probably is the shroud that covered Christ. There's a, <clears throat> when we go, when I go to Israel, um, we, we go to uh, Caesarea Maritime and there at the Hippodrome is they found the um, pilot stone. Yes. Uh, and which is a lot of, a lot of scholars did not feel that Pontius Pilate actually was a procurator. And it, it's funny because where they would do the races with the, with the horses and chariots and all, and all of those things, somebody had taken the stone of Pontius Pilate being the procurator and had put it as a seat in the Hippodrome. So they basically were putting their rear end on that stone <laughs> because they hated this guy so much. And as they were digging through there, they lifted up and found a stone that said Pontius Pilate was the procurator, which once again, you know, for many years, people didn't think Pontius Pilate was really the procurator, and, and, and he actually was. You know, the one archaeological discovery they've never found, and that is the body of Jesus. That's right. Okay. And that, by the way, would end Christianity. If you could somehow figure out that that was the body of Jesus, right. Christianity would be over, as Paul said. Your faith is in vain if Christ has not risen from the dead. Although they did do some testing recently, Pastor Chip, as you know, at the Church of Holy Sepulcher, and uh, because they, they have uh, renovated that uh, yes. area, they went in and they did discover that in their carbon dating that the tomb, uh, I think underneath where they, where they had to renovate, was from the third century, which is when the Church of the Holy Sepulcher was built. So this is a very ancient a tradition that says that that's where his burial spot was. Yeah. But of course, in fact, we were just talking earlier uh, backstage about who, who would want to who would want to disprove Christianity and how could they have done it, Pastor? Chief? Oh, they would have drugged the body all through the streets. Yeah. That's I mean, that's everybody had a reason to. They would have found that body and they would have drug it through the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there was no body. So the, the greatest archaeological evidence is the is the is the there's no. That's body. right. So uh, um, so let's uh, let's continue on here. We got a ton of questions. Questions are coming in like crazy. Goodness gracious. Okay, um, if God planned to, ha to if God planned to sacrifice His Son for our sins, was Judas compelled to betray Him? Compelled? No, because. Knowledge does not imply causality. This is one of the things that I think um, can be confusing when we think about what is known as predestination and free will. Since God is outside of time, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen before we do it, but that does not mean we're compelled to do it. If we were to do otherwise, he would have known that too. Uh, so knowledge does not imply causality. Every mother, new mother that puts her child down for uh, the night when the baby's first born, that mother knows that at some point that baby's gonna wake up during the night, right? But because the mother knows the baby's gonna wake up during the night, does that mean the mother is causing the baby to wake up during the night? No, knowledge does not imply causation. I mean, it might mean causation, but not always. Just because God knows what we're going to do doesn't mean he's causing it, doesn't mean we don't have free will. Now, you could say, yes, God causes it when he creates the universe because he knows how it's going to turn out. Now, that's true. But we're still freely doing what we're doing. We're still free. Judas freely betrayed Christ. You're freely either accepting or rejecting Christ, even though God knows what you're going to do. And this is why I think this is the solution to the predestination free will problem. Yes, we are predestined, but we're also free. In fact, my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, wrote the book, Chosen But Free. You're chosen because it's unavoidable. When God chose to create, he knew how it would turn out. So he's elected the outcome. But that doesn't mean you don't have free will. You still have free will to do what you're going to do. Billy Graham freely chose to accept Christ. Richard Dawkins freely chose not to. And God always knew what they would do. So they are predestined, but they're all f also free. Okay, so let's uh, uh, 
man, they just keep piling in. More a scenario, this is from Jeremy, more a scenario than a question. But let's say you have a friend whose 15-year-old son died in an accident, and she, as a non-Christian, comes to you for comfort. You take the opportunity to tell her about Jesus, and in that process, you learn that she and her deceased son are not saved. She then asks you, why should I want to worship a God that allows my son to burn in hell for eternity? How could I enjoy your concept of heaven knowing people I love are eternally damned or destroyed and I'll never see them again? Right. First of all, if that has just happened, this is not a time for philosophizing or, or uh, going into what you might think are rational explanations. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine lost his son to suicide, and he said people would, well, you know who he is, it's Rick Warren, right? Rick Warren lost his son to suicide, and he said people would call him up or come over to his house and say the most insensitive things because they didn't know what to say. And all he said was, all I wanted was your presence. I don't need an explanation. I don't need rationalizations. I don't need uh, speculations. I just wanted your presence. Your presence was enough. And of course, if you read through the book of Job, you have Job's friends trying to explain everything, and uh, God rebukes them in the end. Uh, so when emotions have subsided a little bit, then maybe it's time to talk about issues like this. Uh, first of all, we don't know in the end whether somebody had a, at the last second accepted Christ, uh, but we do know that God is not going to force anybody into heaven against their will. In fact, if you give me a minute, I'll, I'll explain how this worked. I was in a debate at the University of Michigan a number of years ago and the atheist who asked me this question, his name is Eddie Tabash, he's a Beverly Hills attorney, and uh, he said, Frank, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. She lived a life full of pain and suffering. Uh, toward the end of her life, somebody offered her the gospel, but she rejected it, and then she died. Is she in hell right now? Well, that's a pretty tough question in front of a secular audience, so I said, Eddie, I don't know where your mother is now. I don't know if she had a deathbed conversion or not. But if she didn't, then God is too loving to force her into heaven against her will. You see, because the assumption behind the question is that everybody wants to go to heaven. That's not true. Who's in heaven? Jesus is in heaven. There have been people running from Jesus their entire lives. What's he going to do in the afterlife? Go, hey, where are you going? You're with me now. That wouldn't be fair. You say, well, what's all this business about hell then? Well, I, I used an illustration with the University of Michigan audience, and I asked the ladies this question. So ladies, I'm going to ask you the same question in here. Ladies, have you ever had a man pursue you whom you did not want to date? Some of you are going, yeah, and he's sitting next to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> he will not leave me alone. <laughs> Now, whenever I ask that question, the, the ladies always giggle and the men look at their shoes. Like, is she looking at me right now? <laughs> so anyway, ladies, suppose this man continues to ask you out, he keeps pursuing you, and he keeps asking you out, and you finally say, now look, I like you, but only as a... Ladies, why don't you just stick the knife in and turn it? Every man has heard the dreaded friend rejection. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you ever get the dreaded friend rejection, I have some advice for you. Move on, she's not interested. In fact, I have some shocking news for you. She doesn't even like you as a friend. Because if she did, she, she, she'd be interested, but she's not. Am I right, ladies? I mean, you're just being nice, right? Well, suppose this doesn't deter the guy. He keeps pursuing, he keeps pursuing, he keeps asking you out, and he finally says, look, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. Ladies, run, screaming from the building. Can he force you to love him? No. If he truly did love you, what would he do? He would leave you alone. 
That's what God does for us. He sends us cards, letters, and flowers. He sends us creation. He sends us conscience. He sends us the Bible. He obviously sends us Christ. He sends us Pastor Chip. He <laughs> sends us a, 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 a mission a missionary. He may send us a TV or radio broadcast. If you're in a, a foreign country, like a Muslim country right now, he may send you a dream or a vision, because there's many reports of Muslims being converted through dreams and visions of Jesus appearing to them. But if he does all that, and you keep saying, no, 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 I don't want you, then God will give you up to your own desire. Paul talks about this in Romans 1, right? He says that he'll give you up to your own desire to go your own way, because that's what a loving God does. Just, you can't have love without free will. You have to freely love. And if people don't want to love God, what he's going to do is pull himself away, because that's what a loving being does. You say, well, what's all this business about hell then? Well, notice that there are people today, whether they're Christians or not, that, that experience the common grace of God. They experience nature, beauty, love, relationships, hope for a future. We all experience this, whether we're Christians or not. But I want you to imagine a place where there is no beauty, where there is no love, where there are no relationships, where there is no hope, where there is no future. There's just stone, cold, narcissistic self-absorption. That is Washington. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is hell. You're separated from the ultimate source of goodness by your own choice. Because there is no choice for God. If, he, if you don't want him, he's not going to force himself on you. He's going to leave you alone. And, and hell is separation from God. Hell is a place of justice. Heaven is a place of grace. And if you don't want grace, God's not going to force you there. Now, if you are in heaven and you know of people who are in hell by their own free choice, you are going to know that that's just. You are going to know that they don't want to be in heaven with Jesus. And as C.S. Lewis famously put it, hell cannot veto heaven. Hell cannot veto heaven. People are going to get justice. They're actually going to get justice in heaven, too, because you're going to be rewarded for your good works. You're going to be there on account of grace, but you'll be rewarded for your good works. Or some rewards may be taken away for some of the evil you may have done. But your admittance into heaven is based on grace, and your place in heaven is based on the works you have done. By the way, the same thing is true in hell. There are degrees of punishment in hell, just like there are degrees of reward in heaven. Jesus implies this when he talks about Luke chapter 12, or in Luke chapter 12, about people who knew what uh, the master wanted him to do and disobeyed anyway, and people who didn't have as much knowledge, they were beaten with few, fewer blows, as Jesus said. Look, God is a God of infinite justice. He's also a God of infinite love. He can't allow injustice or injustice to go unpunished. So what does he do? He punishes himself in our place. That's what the gospel is all about. We should all be in hell without his free sacrifice, without his sacrifice for us, because he's an infinitely just being. But even God can't force free creatures to love him because, because love has to be freely given. So what's God supposed to do? I mean, C.S. Lewis, I think, put it best at the end of, or in, 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 this may even be in uh, screw tape letters, now that I think about it, or maybe the great divorce, where he says, in the end, there's only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, or those to whom God says, thy will be done. So hell basically means God is just and loving and man is free. Now, emotionally, that may not resonate, especially after someone has gone through a tragedy. But logically, it makes perfect sense. Is the earth around 8,000 years old is micro and macro evolution biblically compatible? I'm absolutely certain that the universe is at least 59 years old. <laughs> okay, it's actually at least 83, because I saw my mom today down in Fort Myers, so it's at least 83, okay? Uh, as you know, Christians disagree over this, and uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about different views of this. 
But I can guarantee you one thing, that when you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, did you think it was old or young? Right? It is not a test for orthodoxy as to whether or not you think the universe is old or young. Now, I personally think that Genesis 1 was written by Moses as a polemic against the Egyptian creation stories. Because when people are coming out of, ex are coming out of Egypt, they're coming across the desert. They're not walking around going, I wonder how old this place is, right? <laughs> That's not what they're wondering. They're not wondering about evolution. Or, what they're wondering is, Yahweh the true God or are the gods that we just came from in Egypt the true God? gods. And if you look at the Egyptian stories, and, and Chip, you can speak to this better than I can probably, that the gods in, in, in Egypt that supposedly created the universe somehow created themselves or were already in the universe and then ordered it. And Moses comes along and says, no, God is outside this space-time continuum. He creates the space-time continuum and he orders it. So I don't think Genesis 1 is necessarily written to try and tell us how old the universe is. Although some will try and it's, it's a perfectly legitimate interpretation to say yes, but I don't think it's necessary. And as you know, God has written two books. He's written the book called the Bible and the book of nature. And by the way, you can't understand the book called the Bible without the book of nature. I mean, just read the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, what does that imply you already know? First of all, it implies you know language, right? It also implies you know what a beginning is. It implies you have some idea of what God is. It implies you have some idea of what cause and effect is, right? Some idea of what creation is. These are the things you bring to the text and you have to know before you can know anything the Bible says. And in, in, as Chip, he's a seminary professor, he knows there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect of theology called prolegomena, which means what you do before you do theology. And it includes these kind of things, philosophy, language, grammar, cause and effect. The reliability of your senses to know how you can ascertain truths about the real world. So to just look at a text and say it must be taken in this one way, particularly Genesis 1, which looks like it's not Hebrew poetry, but it has poetic elements to it, that could be the right way to text it, but not take it, but not necessarily. Would you want to say anything about the Egyptians or add <clears throat> well, to that at well, all? Well, you know, the Egyptian sun god was their uh -huh. raw, was like the most important. Yeah. I mean, the sun's created on day four. It's almost like... Of oh, the sun, yeah, forget about it. You know, uh -huh. um, it, the, the, yeah, there's there's polemic there. Yeah, I think that you know the the question is is you know if you read the text, does it seem to indicate that there was a day? Yeah, I mean that's that's the literal reading of the text. Mm -hmm. The question is the Hebrew word yom day. What does that mean? Is that a period? Is that you know all that stuff? I think that, and then the question becomes, what are we actually reading in Genesis one? Are we reading a scientific treatise mm. like we think of in the world today? Or are we reading a theological document that's helping the, you know, newly found people that have come out of Egyptian bondage to understand who Yahweh is? And in their world, they did not have the same cosmology that we do. They didn't have the same questions that we do. Um, they believed that matter was eternal. Right. So like even in the creation narrative, which we believe as Christians that the world was created ex nihilo, that means out of nothing. Hebrews 11 says that the things that we see were created of things that weren't seen. But in Genesis 1, the, the reality is in the text, God comes upon the world. It's already there and it doesn't mm -hmm. have any form. It's, mm -hmm. it's void. It, it needs to be put together. And the word create, bara in Hebrew, um, can mean to create something that was not here to something that was here, but it can also mean create in me a new heart, O Lord. In other words, arrange it in a way that's right. So you, you have to ask, is Genesis 1 ontological creation or is it functional creation? Um, and, and so, you know, a reading of the text, you're going to have people bogged down. Some are going to say it's functional creation. God is ordering the world and he's putting things together so that the world functions properly because it's chaotic and mm -hmm. he comes upon it. Others would say, no, this is a scientific thing, you know, um, a la Ken Ham and those types of people. Um, I think the, the real thing is, is that we shouldn't make the reading of Genesis a test for orthodoxy mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Augustine did not believe the world was That's young. Right. Um, and, and then there's other people that do believe the earth is young. Um, I think the, 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 the real thing is, is you have to start asking what does Genesis say? And I do think Christians can disagree on that. Um, but I, my personal feeling is, is that creation is giving us the sense of how God works 
not only in the world, but he works in our hearts. Paul, in the Corinthian correspondence, talks about creation, that the light shone in our hearts. It's the gospel. And the creation story is a wonderful gospel because it's taking something that's chaotic and ordering it to where it's good. And I think that that's what God wants to do in all of creation. He wants to take things that are messed up and not right, and he wants to form them in such a way that they are good. And I think that Romans gestures towards that in chapter eight, that the whole creation is waiting to be put back mm-hmm. together to good, mm-hmm. you know, and God is working all things together for good for those, you know. So I think that, I think Genesis one and Genesis two can be read in, in many different ways. Um, but I would, I would tend to lean towards reading Genesis one and two as uh, uh, probably more, a little bit more, some, some poetics um, with functional um, creation rather than just you know, ontological mm-hmm. creation. And I think, I think the world's old, but I mean, if I get to heaven and God goes, you dummy, it's 10,000 years old. I'm mean, like, I don't care. I believed in Jesus. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what's important, you know? So, uh, um, but some people will say, if you don't take it that way, then you don't believe the Bible. And if you don't believe the Bible, um, I, I, I just would say that the Philippian jailer, when he said, what do I got to do to be saved? Paul didn't say, you got to believe the Bible. They didn't even have one. He said, believe in <laughs> Jesus and you'll be, you'll hey, be let, saved. Let, let so, me mention one other thing, Chip, on sure. this, because about that, um, I mentioned the two books that God has written, the, the, the book of nature and the, and the book called the Bible through other people, obviously. Um, sometimes you side with the book of nature to tell you what the book of Bible, what, 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 the, what the book called the Bible means. In fact, for example, sunrise and sunset, right? The Bible says the sun rises and the sun sets. So how are we to take that? Are we to take it that it's a literal sun that's literally rising and literally setting? Or is this observational language? Well, how do we know it's observational language? Because we know through, through nature that we're actually going around the sun. The sun isn't going around us. And so the Bible is using observational language. Here's an example where you're, you're taking what you know about nature and saying, okay, the Bible's using observational language. It's not literal language. And by the way, we do this today in our scientific age. If you watch the news tonight, the local news, you're going to see the, the, the meteorologist going to say, you know, sunrise tomorrow at 614. He's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent at 614. Okay? So observational language, that's how we understand the Bible. And you can use things from outside the Bible. In fact, you have to use things from outside the Bible to understand what the Bible says. Um, okay. What do you see as the number one challenge against the church in the next 10 years? The number one challenge of the church? In the, the number next... one challenge against the church. Oh, against the church. Apathy. That's it's good. apathy. It's within the church. Yeah. Right? We're the problem. In fact, by the way, <laughs> I, I know you, if, as, as you look around our nation and even around the world, you see things just appear to be just falling apart morally. And you're going, how can this be? Do you know whose fault it is? It's our fault. Why? Because 100 years ago, the church went anti-intellectual. What do I mean by that? 100 years ago, the church didn't think like it could answer Darwinism and these kind of philosophies. So instead of engaging the culture, they separated from the culture. They said, don't study philosophy. Don't study these things. Don't get involved in the media. Don't get involved in law. Don't get involved in in, uh, education. Just believe the Bible. And so they created their own little Bible colleges, their own little seminaries, nothing wrong with that alone, but they actually retreated from the culture. They separated from the culture. And when you take the godly influence out of something, then whatever you've taken that godly influence out of becomes godless. And so what happened was, is that since we're no longer in the media and we're no longer in law and we're no longer in education, John Dewey in the 1930s, the the humanist, kind of took over American education. And he trained, and his philosophy of humanism trained all the Supreme Court justices that eventually rose to the Supreme Court. And in the early 1960s, they just began throwing any expression of Christianity right out of the public square. And the... The great cultural issues that have caused so much consternation among Christians, like abortion and same-sex marriage and, and now sexual orientation, by even by Justice Gorsuch a couple, a couple of years ago, basically putting sexual orientation in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, all that has occurred by the court, not by the people. But why is the court where it is? Because the church extracted itself from the culture 
and allowed the secularists to take over. In fact, back in 2009, I wrote a column on our website, crossexamine.org, but I could have written it yesterday. The, the title is, Country a Mess, Blame the Church. We're the problem. And we're now, we're now so afraid to even say anything because somebody may cancel us on Facebook <laughs> or Instagram or whatever. No, we're called to speak the truth and leave the results to God. In fact, if you really want to help people, I love what Thomas Sowell said. I don't know if you, you know who Thomas Sowell is. Thomas Sowell is a 91-year-old economist who actually grew up in Harlem most of his life and somehow learned to read and then became a professor at Stanford and at University of Chicago and at Cornell. And if you go to, just search for him on YouTube, you'll be binge-watching Thomas Sowell clips. And I don't even know if he's a Christian, but he's so bright. He said this, when you tell someone what they want to, or let me start over. When you tell somebody what they need to hear, you're helping them. When you tell somebody what they want to hear, you're helping yourself. Notice, Jesus gave us one command, one new command. He said, here's a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He sacrificed himself for us. So to love others, we, we should be sacrificing ourselves for others. But when we tell them what they want to hear, we're sacrificing them for us. Because we don't want to put up with the blowback we may get from them. And so we're protecting ourselves when we tell them what they want to hear. We're helping them when, we're t when we tell them what they need to hear. Look, love does not require approval. Our culture thinks love requires approval. Every parent knows that love doesn't require approval. If you approve of everything your kid wants to do, are you loving? No, you're unloving. Same thing is true in the culture. You want to love people? You need to tell them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And most of that revolves around the sexual issues, as you know now, because that's where all the pushback is coming from. Well, that brings us to the next, to the, to the next. You can clap. We clap here, mm -hmm. Grace. The good thing about Frank is he will tell you exactly what he thinks. That's what I appreciate, appreciate about you. There's, you don't candy coat anything. My wife hates that. Does she? Pray for her. So, th so this <laughs> next question goes into this. When discussing the topic of homosexuality with a deconstructing Christian... Uh, wait, discussing the topic of homosexuality with what? When discussing the topic of homosexuality with a deconstructing Christian. Yes. Deconstructing Christians are Christians that are on their way out of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They're talking themselves out of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Their arguments, people who are deconstructing, their arguments for affirming homosexuality is that the actual word was not put in the Bible until 1946 or that the meaning of unnatural relations is only referring to pedophilia? How do you combat this argument with biblical truth that won't be taken as bigotry? As it won't be taken as bigotry. Well, when someone calls you a bigot, you don't want to say, I'm not a bigot. You want to say, what do you mean by bigotry? What does that mean? I had a homosexual activist once call me that, and I said, well, what do you mean by bigotry? And he said, fear and intolerance. And I said, that's not the definition of bigotry. Definition of bigotry is having a firm opinion on something that you haven't researched. You have a prejudiced view. And I said, with all due respect, if anyone is a bigot in this conversation, it must be you because I've written an entire book on this topic and you haven't read it yet. You don't even know why I believe what I believe. So the book I had written was called Correct Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. So I, you can't, you can't, um, predict necessarily how someone, or let me say it differently, you can't control how someone is going to take what you're going to say. You should try and strive to be 100% truth and 100% grace all at the same time. Now, the only person I know who does this successfully is Jesus, right? But we have to be 100% truth and 100% grace at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, think, think of the life of Jesus. Can you remember, or even the apostles, can you remember one time, let's just think Jesus for a second, can you remember any time where Jesus told someone what they wanted to hear? I can think of one time where an apostle did that. In fact, Chip, we were talking about it backstage. The apostle was Peter, and he was trying to 
He was trying to appease the Judaizers who wanted him to continue to obey the Old Testament laws. And what did Paul do? Paul said, I told him to his face that he was wrong. Paul had to dope slap Peter in the Bible, okay, because he's a fallen human being like the rest of us. But Jesus, no, Jesus told people what they needed to hear. So the question about the word homosexuality, it, 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 it appears, what, they said 1945 or something? Whether the word is a, a, a new word or not, that's not the issue. The act is what, the, is, is, what is at play here. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul describes the act. He doesn't use the word homosexuality. He uses unnatural acts. And the unnatural acts were not pedophilia. The unnatural acts were the acts of homosexual sex. And he uses men with men and women with women. And the same thing happens in Leviticus 18, as you know. But Leviticus is uh, an Old Testament document and it deals with the old covenant we're in the new covenant but some of the principles in the old covenant are universal they come into the new covenant this is one of them and so when someone says that they think homosexuality is affirmed by jesus instead of going through a long dissertation as to why you think that's not the case you might want to ask them well why do you think that's true what evidence do you have for that position and if the evidence is well the word wasn't used until 1945 but the act is still described that is really what the word means, the argument doesn't work. It doesn't matter if you use the word or not, the act is described. And why is the act described? Well, you don't really even need the Bible to know that same-sex relationships are not according to the natural design. This is called natural law. Men and women are compatible. They're made for one another to procreate and bring forth the next generation. Two men and two women are not meant for one another. Not if part of the goal, of course, is to procreate and to bring forth the next generation. And natural law says that that's what at least the primary use of the sex is, to procreate and bring forth the next generation. You can't do that when you have two men or two women. You want to add anything to that? Well, <clears throat> um, I, I think that what I would add, and you know, you know, where you, where you do apologetics and you answer questions when it comes to the church, I would, I would say I don't think the church has done a very good job of, of listening and, and, and caring for the homosexual mm -hmm. groups. I think we could have done a much better job over oh, sure, the years no question. Than, than what we've done. And I think we've, we've almost put them into like a category of their own where it's like they're the worst and we're, you know, and, and I think that we've got to rediscover how we can minister to that community. But I do think the two questions are completely separate is, you know, is, does the Bible affirm it and how do we also address and how do we deal with that type of ministry? I think those are two different questions. I would just say that um, anybody who thinks that the word homosexuality was invented in 1946 does not understand any history at all. Plato's symposium that was written hundreds of years before Jesus ever um, came about was all about homosexual relationships. I mean, it, it, there's no question. I mean, th this is not something that's new. Um, and and I, I don't think, I, I, I say, because I have, I have a lot of friends that, that are gay and uh, um, I have some people in, in my family that are, that are that have same-sex attraction, and, and I have some close friends that, that are that way. And one of the things that I, you know, try to always say to them is that, you know, look, I'm gonna love you and, and, and I care about you, but the reality is, is that in, in Romans 1, it's just the, the, the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that people who are walking away from God are one of the things that, is the categories of that is men on men and women on women. And I understand that's a tough, a tough sell in today's culture. I understand when you say those things, it offends people, it gets people up in arms, and we wanna be able to say things in love, just not just in truth too. But I think that uh, um, you know, to, to say that that is something that was invented in 1946, that, that's not true. Um, there is a lot of data that there was pedophilia um, in the first century, but there's no good evidence in Koine Greek that what we're reading in Romans 1 or, or even reading in the um, pastoral epistles um, as well, um, that those are somehow men on men in terms of like men on boys. Um, it, I'm sure it does 
um, take into effect some of those things, but, but, but the, the, the idea is um, unnatural um, sexual relationships. And I think that you have to go all the way back to creation. God created a man and a woman for that intimate relationship in, in marriage. And that's just the way God created it. And we, and we have a fundamental issue here when we say Jesus is Lord. We have to make a decision. Do I follow what Jesus wants me to do or do I wanna do my own thing? There's plenty of things in my life, in Chip Bennett's life, that if I just wanted to go do what I wanted to do would not match up with the Bible. And I could say, but this is the way I feel. This is what's within mm -hmm. me, this is whatever. But at the end of the day, I've decided that Jesus is Lord. And that means that he gets to decide what the rules are, not Chip Bennett. And, and, and that's tough. And it's, a, and it's tough for me. It's probably tough for you at times to say, Jesus, your Lord. But uh, um, I think that those are, the, those are the things that we've got to struggle through. But from a pastoral standpoint, I'm always looking at how can, how can we reach the gay community? How can we reach the lesbian community in a way where they where they feel like that they know that they have value and dignity and worth and you know, they come in here and sit on the front row and we will be glad to have anybody here because we, we, that, that's, that's the gospel. Um, but, uh, but then trying to also teach and to um, talk through those issues become very complicated because, you, because you get pushed away sure. because you're, you, you're, you're, not, you're intolerant, you're, you're whatever. And I'm like the most tolerant person in the world. I mean, I'll sit down with anybody and have a conversation, but it's tough because these are issues that are so um, emotional right now. You know? I don't know so, if it was you, Chip, or another pastor told me this, that um, some folks from the gay community came to the church and uh, afterwards they came up to the pastor and said, are you gay affirming? Which of course means, do you agree with same-sex behavior? And the pastor said, no. And they said, good, because we want you to tell us the truth. We owe people the truth. Again, you, you're only helping yourself when you tell them what they want to hear. You're not really helping them. And uh, Jesus and the apostles are the standard. As you just said, Chip, we don't make up the rules. I remember I got a question once on a college campus. They said, what do you think about homosexuality? I said, it doesn't matter what I think. I'm not the moral arbiter of the universe, okay? I, don't, I didn't make human beings. I didn't make the purpose of life. Uh, God did. And if there is no God, then you don't, then no one has any rights because all rights come from God. They don't come from people. So the only way you can validate a right is to ground it in the nature of God. And that can be a problem, quite obviously, for people who are claiming that they have a right to same-sex marriage or same-sex behavior because they would need to somehow justify that from God. Otherwise, it's just an opinion. It's just a preference. Okay. Let's, uh, um, if atheism, is atheism on the rise and Christianity on decline, or can we expect a revival and reformation? Is atheism on the rise and Christianity in decline? Or can we, is atheism on the rise and Christianity in decline, or could we expect a revival and reformation? I think what they're saying is, is, if atheism's on the rise and Christianity's on oh. the decline, do we expect a revival or a reformation? Well, I'm not a prophet. I, I sure hope we get a, a revival. Uh, but worldwide, Christianity's on the rise. It's only here in our cloistered Western, you know, here in Europe that we think Christianity's dying. Around the world, it's flourishing. Uh, we see now that the group known as nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. These are people that claim no religious affiliation. And this number has, has risen quite a bit in recent years. Uh, I think part of that has risen because it's unfashionable now to be a Christian. You know, 30, 40 years ago, are you a Christian? Everyone would say yes, right? Now there may be some cultural baggage by saying I'm a Christian, and so fewer people are claiming to be Christians, and they're going, you know, I'm really nothing. I'm a nun. Uh, so in this country, Christianity not, uh, is fading, particularly the, the mainline denominations. The, the, the churches like this one here, Grace Community Church here in Sarasota, is growing because it's vibrant and it's preaching the truth. But the mainline ones that hardly believe the Bible's true hardly believe in God. In fact, my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, used to call some of these denominations nothing more than hymn-singing rotary clubs. 
because they just come together to so-called see one another and quote unquote do good works, but they don't really believe the Bible is true. They hardly even believe in God. In fact, I think our culture today is best explained not by theology, but by meology. Whatever I want, that's my, that's my faith. I'm going to create a God in my image. God hasn't created me in his image. I'm going to create a God in my image. So it's all about meology. I get to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with, and God approves. I get to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and God approves. Uh, God is all about pleasing me. I'm really God's pet. He's, he is under, um, he's under obligation to take care of me. That's what people think God is like. So it's really more meology than theology, except for the conservative churches, in my view anyway, that are preaching the truth. I think that, uh, but I think, the, I think the American church has had a lot to do with creating a meology. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, God's for you. He's your co-pilot or you're his, you know, mm -hmm. you know, your best life. It's, you know, it's almost like Jesus is a life coach right. rather yes. than Lord. And I think a lot of stuff we've done to create some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, here's a good one. What's up with the book of Leviticus? Where, well, God call, where God calls for the gruesome deaths of almost everyone for a variety of reasons, but generally for either not believing in him for li or living an alternative lifestyle and daring to have children with a widow or sex out of wedlock. What's up with the book of Leviticus? Oh, are you, I, I'm, he may be referring to whoever may be referring to capital crimes. Is that yeah, right? I, I'm guessing so. Yeah, capital crimes. I think there are about 19 or 14, and I can't remember how many total capital crimes there are in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, I should say, was just between God and Israel. God was their king. And there were capital crimes for things today we wouldn't consider to be capital crimes because God is trying to get the promised people in the promised land to bring forth the promised Messiah, and he has to do so through free creatures. So he has a higher standard of judgment on these people than he does the rest of the world. And that's where those laws come from. Now you get to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 8.13 says the old covenant is obsolete. It no longer applies. In fact, where you might have had, say, um, you might have had a death penalty for a particular offense in the Old Testament, in the New Testament it might be you're disfellowshipped or you're kicked out of the church, or there's some other kind of, of problem, uh, or, or punishment, I should say, for the crime. So in the Old Testament, God's judgment comes down quite hard on these issues because he's trying to bring the promised people in the promised land to bring forth the promised Messiah. In the New Testament, you don't have those, as many of those capital crimes. He, get, he delegates that to government. As Paul says in Romans 13, he says, the ruler does not bear the sword for nothing. What is the purpose of government? The main purpose is to prevent innocent people from being hurt, to protect innocent people from evil. And God can use the sword to execute justice, Paul says. And that can include capital punishment as punishment and to protect innocent people from evil. But those capital offenses no longer apply in the New Testament. Anything to add to that? No, that's good. I want to keep, I, right. literally, I can just scroll okay, this question. Right. I just want to try to go is, when discussing with a progressive Christian, mm -hmm. what are your one or two go-to points that you bring up? Okay, let me just say one thing about progressive Christianity. These are people that claim that traditional Christian beliefs are not true, even including to the atonement. They think the atonement was cosmic child abuse. Well, if you don't have the atonement, you don't have Christianity. They're very pro-LGBTQ in terms of behavior, okay? Uh, they uh, don't think the Bible's inerrant. They don't think Jesus was God. They basically deny many of the essentials of the faith. So in my view, a progressive Christian is neither progressive nor Christian. Because if you're disagreeing with Jesus, how can you be a Christian? And if you're disagreeing with Jesus, you're not progressing, you're regressing. But the one or two points I would want to make, I would want to ask them, I would want to ask them why they believe what they believe first. I wouldn't want to make any points. I would try and discover why they believe what they believe. And you mentioned deconstruction, or a questioner did. Deconstruction meaning you're deconstructing your faith and you're actually, you're actually constructing a new faith. 
A lot of it is just what you, you want to be true when you do that. I've, I haven't seen any major deconstructions that did not in some way revolve around the issue of sex. It's, it always somehow has to do with sex. People are giving up Christianity because they want to have more freedom to do what they want to do sexually. Hey, I get that. But basically what you're doing is you're trading the eternal God who sacrificed himself for you for a temporal, pleasurable activity. And it's going to end in eternity. So what happens when the sex ends? Can so you, I, would want to, I would want to ask them why they believe what they believe first. And, and, and to be fair, not all progressive Christians who, who say they're progressive Christians believe every single thing. No. It, 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 it's, it, it, there's, because cause I, I, I've got people that would say they don't believe certain things that maybe I would see the Bible saying a certain thing, but they still believe that Jesus is God and rose again on the third day, but they're, 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 they're questioning a lot of the fundamental things, like is the Bible the inerrant word of God? They've got a hold of a book that makes them question. Yeah, I, I think questioning is fine, but then saying the Bible is not the word oh, of well, God I, no, I, and the atonement is not true Sure, and well, Jesus is not God, then the, they're out of the... the well, the very, first, the very first question that's presented in the Bible is did God really say? Yeah, that's right. Once you throw God's word out, you're done. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say that as the pastor of this church? Once you throw God's word out, we're done. We're done. I mean, there's, there's nothing to stand on. We're yeah. done, you know? Um, hey, Chip, can I say which, that? Which whether, I mean, that's why I teach the Bible here and try my best yeah. to, to go through the Bible because I think once that's out, then you can believe whatever you want it's, to believe. It's okay to want evidence that the Bible's true. I mean, that's predominantly what our ministry does, crossexamine.org, is provide evidence that the Bible's true. But if you're claiming to be a Christian and you're claiming the Bible isn't true, well, what's your standard then? What is it? Sure. All right. Somebody, they're mad at you. Um, let's continue on here. Um, do you think we're in the end times? Sorry? Do you think we're in the end times? We've been in the end times since Paul. That's right. <laughs> so hey, Jesus could come at any minute. He said, I come like a thief in the night. No one knows the day nor the hour, the times nor the season. So yeah. nobody on TV knows when he's coming back. If uh, Jesus himself as a man didn't know, as God he did know, but not as a man. And by the way, let me say one thing. I think that part of the ambiguity about the end times is similar to the ambiguity that came when the Messiah came. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 that it, it basically if uh, he said this mystery has been hidden uh, until the present time because if the powers of this world knew, they never would have killed the Lord of glory. If you go through the Old Testament prophecy without the New Testament, you wouldn't figure out when the Messiah was going to come, not in one place anyway. You have to piece together a whole bunch yeah. of stuff to figure it out. It looks much, it's much clearer after it happens. And you go, oh, now I see how Isaiah 55 and Daniel 9 and Micah 5, 2 and all these passages come together. I didn't see it if I was just in the Old Testament. And maybe part of the reason is, is because if you could see it too clearly, if it wasn't veiled, they never would have killed Christ. And maybe the same thing is happening going forward. If Jesus was too clear, if you, we, we knew he was coming back in 2032. How, would that change how we live today? It might. It might, yeah, it, yeah I got time, right? <laughs> By the way, that, that's what people always go, what's, what's the line that I, if I step over, then I'm no longer in or out or whatever? I'm like, well, if, if he gave us that line, yeah, we'd be playing this number right. all day long, you know? Um, it, so, uh, um, and, and I think the whole end times thing is, it, this is just me, you don't have to, I, I just think that the end times and the um, obsession that we have is a very American thing. Like a, yeah. lot, of, a mm -hmm. lot of Christians around the world do not have the same true. thoughts that we do about it. They're like, you guys are crazy. Like you guys are crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're looking for everything. You're like the, the big vacuum cleaners getting ready to suck everybody up. You know, you're just like, you're, you guys are crazy. Um, yeah, I, I think we don't understand the idea of the end times. The last day started when Jesus rose. And so th th that's just not even a, th the question may be, are we close to Jesus' return? We're closer today than we were five minutes ago. Yeah, that's and, the answer. And, and think about it this way too. Uh, all of us are more certain about when Jesus is gonna come for us 
than when Jesus is going to come for the world. What do I mean by that? Everyone in this room knows you're going to be dead. Probably within years, decades, some younger people, maybe a couple of scores of decades, maybe 40, 50 years, everyone in this room will be gone. These young guys, maybe we can give them 60, 70 years, right? We're more certain when we're going to see Jesus than when we're going to see him come back. So that's the real, that's the more important coming, isn't it? Okay. Um, how do you respond to someone who says, because Jesus died for my sins, then there's nothing stopping me from sinning. We have a free pass. Romans 6. Take it away, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> Romans Shall 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> God right. forbid. God right? forbid it. Make a noito is the Greek word. May that thought never enter into your mind. That's right. That's right. No, that's... And if you look at First uh, John 3, people who stay in known sin are probably not saved. Stay in known sin, meaning they don't want to get out of it. Scary. Okay, I really struggle in understanding the ontological argument for the existence of God. What is your take on this argument? Do you think it is sound? So do I. Okay, the ontological argument for the existence of God, I don't use because it is so controversial. And whenever you're trying to present someone good arguments... You don't want to use weaker arguments because then they're going to ignore your good arguments and harp on your weaker argument if they're a skeptic. So I don't use the ontological argument. Um, I use arguments like the cosmological argument, which says the universe had a beginning, therefore it must have had a beginner. The teleological argument, which is a design argument, which says that there's design in the universe and design in life, there must be a designer. The moral argument, which says that there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like say it's wrong to torture babies for fun or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there's no standard beyond us, then everything's just a matter of opinion, and we know those things aren't just a matter of opinion. They're really wrong. So there must be a standard beyond us that we're obligated to obey, God's nature. God's nature is good, and we're obligated to obey it. We're his creatures. Okay, so I don't use the ontological argument. But if you want to see a pretty good, uh, positive depiction of the ontological argument, go to reasonablefaith.org. That's William Lane Craig's website. And he's got these, actually his YouTube channel, he's got short little animated videos on all the major arguments for God. And he does a fair job on the ontological argument. So go there. And you can also watch one on the cosmological, teleological, and moral arguments as well. So this is a good one because this rolls right in here. Um, Adam says... Uh, um, Atheists use moral judgment just like Christians. Yes. How do you know that God is good? Didn't you use a moral judgment? Or do you think God is good because you think he told you he's good? Well, the concept of morality is a positive concept, not a negative one. Uh, Satan is a fallen angel, in other words. Evil can't exist unless good exists. Evil is a privation in good. Uh, in other words, when people say there's too much evil in the world, um, you want to ask them, what do you mean by evil? Because they will have a difficult time explaining what evil is without referring to good. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you've got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? It doesn't exist, right? It can't exist. Uh, evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of the car, you got a better car. If you take all the car out of the rust, what do you have? Nothing. It doesn't exist. In other words, evil can only exist as a parasite in a good thing. So ultimate reality can't be evil. Ultimate reality can only be good. And this is why C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity points this out. He says strict dualism can't be true. What's strict dualism? That there are equal and opposite forces a good force and an evil force. That can't, or the yin-yang you see in, uh, in the, the New Age, right? That can't be ultimate reality because the bad force has to borrow from the good force to even exist. In order for Satan to exist, he has to have being, which is good. He has to have free will, which is good. In fact, Satan metaphysically is good because he has these qualities. He has mind, emotion, and will. And in order for him to do evil, he has to have those good qualities. But you can't imagine a completely evil thing. 
It doesn't exist. It has to borrow or steal from good. So ultimate reality is good. And that's how one way we know that God is the source of goodness. He is ultimate reality. It's not arbitrary. He is the standard of goodness. Okay. Um, if God and heaven is so majestic, why are we living in such a predictable and natural world? Why don't we see miracles around the world? Well, what is the purpose of a miracle according to the Bible? The purpose of a miracle is to point back to God in some way. The primary purpose is to point back to God. Uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Well, why is he going to trust me, God? I'm just, a, I'm just a sheep herder. Why is the great Pharaoh going to trust that he ought to listen to me? God says you'd be able to do miracles, right? So he goes to Pharaoh and he, can, he does miracles. By the way, one of the interesting miracles that occurs, as you know, is when Pharaoh, I mean, when uh, Moses throws down his staff, it turns into a snake. And then the Egyptian magicians do the same thing. Apparently, you can actually take a, a serpent, a snake of some kind, and if you paralyze it just right, you can, when you throw it down, it'll, it'll wake up. Now, I've never tried this myself, right? I've, I've heard of this, okay? So there are tricks to do this, but what happens after they have that showdown? Moses' snake eats Pharaoh's snake. Why is that important? What is the symbol of Egypt? It's on the sarcophagus of King Tut. What do you see up there? A cobra, right? Basically, this little incident shows that, God's, that God is the true God, that Yahweh beats up the gods of Israel. And all of the plagues, if you look at the plagues, they're slams on the Egyptian gods. Right. They worship frogs. You want frogs? We'll give it to you. They worship the Nile, we'll turn it to blood. They worship the firstborn, or they worship Pharaoh, he's God, we'll kill the firstborn. They worship the sun, we'll blot it out, right? These miracles finally show Pharaoh, you are the true God. Now, he has a change of heart later, as you know. But the point here is, is that miracles are showing the truth about God. And miracles, like the resurrection, have to be rare events. If they occurred all the time, they would lose what we call their apologetic value. Imagine if resurrections occurred routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean? Nothing. I mean, you go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. You know, now I got to give the inheritance back. No. It's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event. In fact, the only way you could recognize miracles is against the backdrop of natural events occurring over and over again. Why is this world so regular? Well, one way, if it wasn't regular, it couldn't live. You've got to have a, a, a natural laws doing the same thing over and over again so our bodies could function. But secondly, without that backdrop of natural laws, of things happening over and over again the same way, you would never be able to recognize a miracle and, or an act of God unless you saw it was an exception to that regular event. Now, again, I'm not saying miracles can't occur today. I think they do occur today. In fact, a mutual uh, scholar that both uh, uh, Dr. Bennett and I know, Craig Keener, has written a hernia-inducing two-volume set called Miracles, where he goes in and he goes around the world and actually gets documented evidence of miracles occurring. But these things occur normally in places that don't have the kind of access that we have to the Bible and other things. But I don't know if Craig, I can't remember, uh, Dr. Bennett, if, he's, if he found any resurrections. Resurrections are extremely rare, if at, if at all. No, but th there, there are, you know, and again, we don't have, it's, you know, it's hard to tell, but there, mm -hmm. are, th there do seem to be people that have died and mm -hmm. resurrected, but, but it's hard to, to determine. You know, I think we would be best to be skeptical right. on, 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 on things that we, you know, and we should, Jesus always said, go show yourself to the priest. Right. If you've been healed, you should be able to show yourself and it should be healed. Um, but the, the question though, um, and I think this, he was asking about um, 
the, the, the natural world and it's so predictable. I don't know that the world is really that predictable. I mean, there is majesty in the world today. Mm -hmm. there, there's beauty in the world. I mean, I was driving, me and Mindy were on a date night last night and we were driving. She goes, I want to go on an adventure. I want to just be awed by nature, you know, and, and, and I'm like, where do you want to go? She goes, just somewhere, you know, and she's like, I'm awed every day. I see things and whatever. I think that the way we, whatever these are that we put on, we tend to see what we want to see. You know, our attitude determines the way we see things. I think the world's incredible. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's, I mean, I know that there are natural laws, but, but I don't think that there's not majesty in the world oh. and there's not like yeah. beauty in the world. I mean, you know, I, I, you go sit out on the beach and watch the sun go down and you're just like, wow. But there's people that'll sit on the beach and go, I ain't nothing, I want to play my play my phone. Well, so one person saw beauty, one person played on their phone. I, I think that sometimes that beauty depends on how we're, we're looking for, but I don't know that the world that we're in is just doesn't really show because the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The, the heavens are pretty incredible. Oh, they are. You know, the heavens so, declare the glory of God. That's right. You know, Last so, time I had the opportunity to be here, we talked about how awesome the heavens are. Uh, we mentioned that the number of stars in the universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth times 100,000. And to go from one star to another star just in our galaxy, go in space shuttle speed of five miles a second would take you over 200,000 years. And the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those that fear him. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways? So are my moral ways higher than your immoral ways? I mean, this is the kind of being we're dealing with. So it's beyond majestic. And let's just briefly look at one simple thing. It's, well, it's not simple, but we've all experienced it because we're all here. Um, we, we've all been born. How many people have seen someone else born? Every mother should go, yes, I've seen someone else born. Men, you've seen someone else born. When you see your own flesh and blood come out of another human being, you don't go, evolution! <laughs> right? You go, this is amazing! How does this happen? But it happens every day, and yet it causes just to become basically jaundiced about it. Like, oh, it's no big deal. What incredible that is! Human biology, reproduction? How can you say there's no mind behind that? That takes a lot more faith than saying there's some mind behind this. This is incredible. All right, next one. We don't stone people to death anymore because we as a society realize it's needlessly cruel. But at one point in history, God was cool with it. What's up with that? I, I didn't catch the first okay. part. What was we, it? We don't stone people oh. to death oh. anymore okay. because we as a society realize it's needlessly cruel. But at one point in history... God was cool with it. What's up with that? Um, well, today we do something far worse. We actually dismember children in the womb, and we call it a moral right. You know, I had a situation on a college campus not long ago where um, a young woman brought up the God killing people in the Old Testament. And I went through my answer to it, and then I said to her, hey, do you mind if I ask you a question? Um, you shared a real problem with God killing people. So I said, um, where are you on the abortion issue? And she said, oh, oh I'm pro-choice. I said, let me ask you a question. When God decides who dies in the Old Testament, you call him immoral. But when you decide who lives and dies here today, you call that a moral right. Can you justify that for me? God can't play God, but you can. God can take life anytime he wants. He's the author of life. In fact, if Christianity is true, people don't really die. They just change location, right? They just go from this life to the next life, and it's up to God when that happens. He's under no obligation to give us 80 Health, healthy years here on earth. He could take us out at two years old or 82 years old. That's up to him. But we don't have that same right, yet we claim we have that same right to do so. So I don't know the, um, the process of stoning, Chip. I don't know how long it takes you to die when you're stoned. 
They say that they would look to see a uh, um, uh, brain when they crush the it, skull. It could to, be instant. I don't uh, know. Which is crazy because if that happened to Paul, you know, it, which is interesting because in 1 Corinthians 2, he says that he was with them in weakness and fear and much trembling. There's, mm -hmm. there's thoughts that Paul, because he had been stoned and had been, you know, had right. been, been alive, that, that he, he suffered from like a... Uh, um, Seizures. Yes. And, and so he might be preaching and fall into a seizure into the Corinthians. They thought, well, this guy's whack. You know, and Paul's like, no, I bear in my body the scars of Jesus in weakness. God uses me. You know, so, but the, the idea is maybe stoning was, I, I don't know. You know, it, it, it's, it's all. By question. the way, the, 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 the question is a moral question, as you notice. I don't know who's asking the question, but if an atheist is asking the question, I always ask, by what moral standard are you judging this to be wrong? Because if you're an atheist, you don't have a moral standard. That's exactly right. That's just your opinion. Now, it's fair for an atheist to say, okay, I might not have a moral standard, but you as a Christian claim this is a God of love, so how do you explain this particular uh, problem, so to speak? That's a fair question. But I see atheists all the time stealing from God while they're arguing against him, which is the subject of a book we have out on the book table called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. They're actually stealing a standard of morality to complain about God, which is odd because, as you know, Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, called God unjust uh, many times, and yet, on the other hand, he will say there is no justice, there is no right and wrong, there is, there is nothing good or bad, we're just dancing to our DNA. Well, look, you can't have it both ways. That's right. You can't have something be unjust and at the same time say there's no such thing as justice. Either. Justice exists, and that means God exists, or justice doesn't exist, and God doesn't exist, and your complaint is irrelevant because there's no such thing as justice or unjustice. It's just, it's, it, they're all self-defeating. It's like people yeah. go, well, truth can't be known. Really? How do you know that's true? Yeah, how do you know that's true? You know, how do you I mean, know it's true? You know, there's no truth. Yeah. Um, the question here, why did the Protestant reformers remove the deutero deuterocanonical books? They didn't. Um, the the um, Apocrypha was added. Um, 1546, 1547 at the Council of Trent by the Catholic Church because they had a problem with purgatory with Martin Luther and they needed to have some biblical support to support it. They didn't have it, so they added it at the Council of Trent. So the reformers did not remove it. It was added by the Catholic Church. Um, what's up with many evangelical Christians' tendency? This is a good question. I uh -huh. like this question. What's up with many evangelical Christians' tendency to move further to the right, becoming more militant, less loving towards the least fortunate and more demanding of our Christian rights. Is this just not a return to Constantine where they wanted the state to force Christianity on everyone? Are the nuns reacting to this form of selfish Christianity? Yeah, I can't speak to what other people are doing. Christ, uh, Jesus is our standard. Uh, and I will say that you don't judge any religion by its heretics. Okay? You don't judge... You don't judge any philosophy by its abuse either. You judge it by its proper use. Uh, I do see probably more of a uh, kind of a, a, a natural human nature when you are being somewhat persecuted to want to lash out and try and grab your rights back. I get that. And I personally believe that we Christians should seek the truth in politics like we do everywhere else. In fact, um, if I had an opportunity, I would show you a, a satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula. And if you ever you Google Korea satellite night on your iPhone, you'll see this image of South Korea being full of light and North Korea being almost completely dark. And the, the, the reason that these two countries are different is one thing, politics. You have political freedom in the South, you don't have any in the North. The North is a concentration camp. And my question to people is, which country would you rather live in, South Korea or North Korea? Where do you think the gospel is spreading more, South Korea or North Korea? Well, South Korea. And if we care about religious freedom and we care about the ability to live and preach the gospel, we have to care about the laws that are made in Washington, Tallahassee, and your local Saratoga City Council, or wherever that is, right? Now, that doesn't mean that's your primary calling, but you have to care about it. And, but, but you have to do it in a way that brings honor to Christ. You don't, you know, you don't get all ornery and ugly with people. In fact, what does Peter say about this? He says that if you treat people well, 
who treat you well, well, you're no better than anybody else. Right. But if you treat people well who are mean to you, then you can show them the love of Christ, and that's what we ought to do. Did Jesus ever say that he was the second person in the Godhead? Um, I, I, I'll answer this real quickly. Jesus over and over and over again did things and said things that would, that would that the Jews picked up stones to stone him because they said that he was God. And he didn't go, hold on, don't stone me because I didn't really claim that I was God. <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 so so he, the, the reason we call it the second person in the Godhead is because we say, well, Jesus was God and we have the Father. So um, yes, Jesus is, is, uh, is God. What do you think of Andy Stanley's book, Irresistible? What book? What, his book, Irresistible, Andy Stanley. Oh, Irresistible. I reviewed Andy's book. I don't agree with everything in Andy. I, I don't, look, Andy is a friend of mine. I've known Andy for over 20 years. I don't agree with everything Andy says or does. I agree with about 95% of what he says and does. And I don't even agree with 95% of what I say and do. Okay, so. Uh, but I, I did review the book, Irresistible. And the main point of Irresistible is that he was trying to say that our apologetic ought to be the resurrection uh, to get people to become Christians. And that, that was the apologetic of the first century Christians, and it's our apologetic, it should be our apologetic today. In other words, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the other, Paul, and the other, uh, uh, other apostles are going around trying to get Gentiles to become Christians, they didn't say, you've got to believe this in Aaron Old Testament. Right? What they said was, Jesus rose from the dead. He's the Savior. Now, after they became Christians, then the Bible, the Old Testament, and the promised New Testament was a conclusion that they came to. It wasn't a premise. In other words, inerrancy of the Bible is not a premise when you're going out trying to witness to people. You don't, it would be like walking up to a Muslim and saying, you ought to believe the... Uh, uh, you ought to believe in Christianity because the Bible says so. What's he going to say? No, you ought to believe in Islam because the Quran says so. Well, you're at a stalemate then, right? How do, you know the, how do you know the Bible's true? How do you know the Quran's true? Remember, Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? I mean, Paul wrote Romans. Why? Not because he read something in a book, but because the risen Jesus appeared to him. John wrote John because the risen Jesus, the risen Jesus appeared to him, etc. You get the idea. In other words, the New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. Thankfully, they did write it down so we could know about it and orient our lives toward it. But the reason Christianity is true is not because a series of documents we call the Bible says it's true. The reason Christianity is true is because an event occurred, the resurrection. And from that event, then we can ascertain that the Bible's true. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, whatever he teaches is true. Jesus taught the entire Old Testament is the word of God, and he promised the New Testament. Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody rises from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says. Okay? So this is the main point that Andy's trying to get, a point, get across in Irresistible. He's trying to say that Jesus is our standard. And you can arrive at inerrancy later. You don't start there. I mean, imagine, imagine if a Muslim came to you and said, you ought to be a Muslim because the Quran says, uh, says Islam's true. What are you going to say? Well, I don't believe in the Quran. You got to give me evidence the Quran is true, right? Same thing is true when an unbeliever is going to say to you, well, I don't, why would I believe the Bible? You got to give me evidence it's true. How is it just to expect a human who has an average of 70 to 80 years to make an eternal decision? What if... I'm humanity, what if humanity, they wanted to be separated from God, but to be absent from the body, do they get another chance? Is it just for somebody who has 70, 80 years to make an eternal decision? Okay, uh, first of all, it's a moral question. So it's saying that somehow God would be immoral for only giving us 70 to 80 years to make a decision. I don't know why that would be the case. I think that's plenty of time to make a decision. And you know there's an age of accountability and it seems, I don't know what you think about this, Pastor Chip, but it seems like people who die before the age of accountability, like, for example, David's baby, uh, are in heaven. After the age of accountability, then you have to make a choice because God will not force you into heaven against your will. Now, what is the age of accountability? Well, back then, who knows? Six, seven, today, 36, 37? I don't know. Um, so uh, I would say that God is going to be just. He's not going to be unjust. Secondly, the eternal 
the act, or sometimes the question is asked this way, how can somebody go to hell for a temporal sin? Right? Well, the length of the time it took to commit a crime is not the length of the time you're going to serve your punishment. It could take three seconds to murder somebody, but your punishment's not going to be for three seconds. Right? It's going to be a lot longer. Secondly, if you've sinned against an infinite being, just like if you murder a police officer, you're probably going to get a stiffer sentence, in most states anyway, than you would if you murder anybody else. Because there's an added punishment when you try and murder somebody who's out there trying to protect people. So the sin against the infinite being is the ultimate sin. Thirdly, who said you stop sinning when you get to hell? You're still willing against God in hell. So I think the time allotted is enough, and God is going to be just. No one in the afterlife is going to go, oh, God, if I only had more time. Oh, God, if, if you had only given me more evidence. Going back to the, these, because these are the questions, mm -hmm. the sexual questions. They're okay. the ones, you, you get them on college campuses more than anything, mm -hmm. don't you? How do you deal with homosexuality within the church, sharing Christ with someone who identifies as a homosexual, and dealing with your own conflicting feelings in the wake of scientific research showing genetic disposition to homosexuality? So I think what the Christian's asking, um, how do you deal with it in the church if you're sharing Jesus to someone who says they're a homosexual and you're struggling on the inside of how to deal with that because you're convinced the scientific research shows that they may have a genetic disposition towards it. Okay, first of all, I, I don't want to say anything until I hear their story. I want to sit down and talk to them and say, how did you get to where you are? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you something a, a person I know who's a, a pastor who has thousands of people in his church said to me once. He said, I've never met a lesbian who is not sexually abused. So you can understand why someone like that would not want to be with a man. So I want to, I want to try and find out why they believe or feel the way they feel, okay? Only after that might I try and bring uh, some points to the conversation. And one of the points might be, we all have attractions we ought not act on. There's a difference between attractions and actions. Every one of us uh, have attractions that we ought not act on. If you acted on every one of your attractions, you'd be dead already. I know I would. And one of the most important verses in the entire Bible for our culture right now is Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. In fact, it says, above all else, guard your heart. What does our culture say? Guard your heart, or, or follow your heart. Bible says, guard your heart. Don't follow your heart because your heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can know it? And if you think your heart is good, let me just give you one quick illustration as to why it's not. Let's suppose before you came here tonight, you went into the bathroom to get ready, you looked in the mirror, and you saw there was a sign attached to your head, and it transmitted every single thought you had. You couldn't cover it, you couldn't turn it off. Everybody who saw you could read what you were thinking. Would you be here right now? I wouldn't be here because our thoughts are evil, aren't they? It's easy to be bad, it's hard to be good. We need to resist many times what we want to do. Because if you follow your heart, many times it's going to end in disaster. And our culture says, no, follow your heart. The truth is, we have to follow the truth. We have to follow the Savior. And I know this is a difficult, you know what? It, this is like abortion, I think, in, in this sense, Pastor Chip. This issue is not difficult intellectually. It's difficult emotionally. Because we all know people and we want what's best for them. And we say, well, um, who are you, how are you going to find companionship if you don't find somebody of the same sex because you're not attracted to the opposite sex? So we're like, oh. we, we want you to find companionship. We want you to find a mate. So emotionally, it's difficult. But intellectually, it's not difficult. Intellectually, God has made us men and women, and yet we live in a fallen world, and we have tendencies and hearts that want to go the wrong way. And actually, our goal is not to find a mate as much as we want to it. Our goal is to become like Jesus. 
Our goal is to know Christ and to make him known. That's why we're here. And tragically, unfortunately, one of the most, well, it's not tragic that sex is one of the most powerful and love is one of the most powerful um, events or, it's not the right word. Sex is a powerful endeavor that we want to engage in. Yet because it's so powerful, it could also be so dangerous. Sex is like fire. If you put it in your fireplace, it's wonderful. It'll warm you. You get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. And our culture wants to treat us or wants to call sex just physical. Oh, sex is just physical. No, sex is not just physical, and we all know it's not. If sex, were, if sex is just physical, why is it worse if somebody rapes you than if somebody just physically assaults you? If sex is just phys physical, why is it that if your spouse has sex with somebody else, you don't go, oh, that's just like a workout? Because sex is not just physical. It's emotional. It's moral. It's spiritual. It transcends the physical. And we want to treat it like it's just physical. Oh, did you score tonight? What is it, a game? It's incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly dangerous because of that. And if you read Paul in Romans 1, there's not a more relevant passage in the scriptures with this. If we suppress the truth about God to go our own way, we're going to wind up with a futile mind, futile thinking, and a depraved mind where we are cheering on other people who are doing evil. And I think illicit sex can do that to all of us. Do you know people right now who are involved in illicit sexual relationships who are just acting irrationally? You know she's not for you. Look at the signs. She's blinded to it. You know you shouldn't be with him. Look at the signs. Blinded to it. They're suppressing it because it is so powerful. And that's how many times in the scriptures does it say flee sexual immorality? We don't like that today, but it's for our own good. They're guardrails. Actually, 1 Corinthians 6.18 doesn't say flee. It says continually be fleeing sexual immorality. They're guardrails. It's, it's, a, yeah, it's not just a one time. In fact, God's uh, commands are guardrails to us. You know, you can drive down the highway and get anywhere you want if you stay between the guardrails, right? But if you start going through the guardrails or into the median, you're not going to make it. Question, when you buy a new car and you read the manual and it says, do this, but don't do this, do this if you want to flourish with this car. Don't do this if you don't want to flourish. Don't do this if you want to get hurt. Don't do this, or if you, if you want to not get hurt, please don't do this or you'll destroy yourself in the car. Do we get mad at Hyundai or Ford or Chevy or whoever when they tell us don't do these things? Well, why do we get mad at God when he writes a manual for us and says don't do these things? Why are we mad at him? They're guardrails. Yeah, his law is always for our best interests mm -hmm. and the one who created us knows us better than ourselves. Question, one, on one of your podcasts, this is somebody asked this question, you said there was a book that had proof for the exodus from Egypt. Is there, do you recall that? Uh, yes, listen to our, um, on our YouTube channel, the Cross Examine YouTube channel, every Thursday night, we'll do one tomorrow night too, Lord willing, uh, but every Thursday night we do a live stream and about a year or so ago, we did one with Titus Kennedy and Stephen Meyer on 10 evidences from Egypt for the exodus. Titus Kennedy is a uh, archaeologist who has done excavations all over the world. In fact, he personally went to Egypt, actually Sudan, it was Egypt during Exodus times, and found or refound, confirmed, the oldest inscription of Yahweh in the world. And it, it is in Sudan, at the time it was Egypt, and this inscription comes from 1400 B.C., when was the Exodus? 1406. I'm sorry, 1446, if you take the biblical dating. And there are many other evidences for this. So take a look at that on our YouTube channel. Well, we're four minutes past the time. Um, 
and I want to honor people's um, time. Have you enjoyed tonight? Um, the, the, there are literally so many questions. I mean, I can just scroll and scroll. And so we, because we're online as well. And um, I, I know we didn't get to answer all of them, but we continue to do these things because we want to be a church that, that, that answers questions. You know, and you may be here tonight and go, I didn't agree with everything or whatever. That's fine. But, but aren't you at least proud that we're a church that's willing to take whatever question comes and, and try our best to, to, uh, to, to answer it. Um, I, I also want to say, um, this is important, please hear this, um, we, we, we really value this type of stuff. Um, if you are interested in, in some of this on in, in a more intimate level, we do have a um, small group that's called Hardest Questions Answered, um, and that small group starts September 8th. It's 7.30, you can go online and sign up for it, but that's an apologetics type of uh, small group. So if you're wanting maybe some more questions answered, it's a great place to go. We got some real competent leaders for that, but this is a value that we have at Grace is that we wanna make sure that if you go here, if you have questions, if you have things that you just wanna know the answer to, we want you to know that this is a safe place to ask those questions um, because uh, we, we do believe, and I think Frank, you would agree with me that we have every reason in the world to throw Christianity out there in the arena of truth because it wins. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry we're out of time, but if anyone wants to uh, talk privately, have a question, I'll go out by the book table. Yeah, he's got books out here. If you'd like to get books, DVDs, he'll, um, somebody would ask a question, would you be signing books? You'll sign books. Sure. Yeah. He'll sign Rocky Balboa, whatever you want. To, um, but uh, he'll, uh, he, he'll be out there. Frank, awesome. Can we give Frank a... Uh, um, and, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, man, he's, he's the man. Um, and I will, I'm going to hang out here in the sanctuary. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, um, I'll, I'll hang out. Something that was burning, you know, um, in your mind, I'll, I'll hang out a little bit too. Frank's going to hang out there. We do have to leave at 8.15. 8.15. So, 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 so we got that. Okay. Um, real quickly, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to do this. Thank you for that we live in a, um, a country that we do have the freedoms to do these things. We take that, uh, um, we do not take that lightly. Um, we're appreciative of that. Um, I pray that you would continue to bless our church as we continue to try to answer the tough questions. And Lord, I pray for any of those that have doubt or struggles or whatever, Lord, that uh, um, eventually we could maybe get to them and help them um, process through that. Maybe we don't have the answer immediately, but we will do our best to be with them and to struggle with them through those issues. Um, because we do believe, Lord, that ultimately um, that Jesus did rise from the dead and that is the reason Christianity um, exists and why it's so true. And uh, Lord, I pray that if anybody here or online does not know you as Lord and Savior, um, Lord, I pray that they would make that decision to turn their heart to you and ask for forgiveness of sins and believe that you died on the cross for their sins and rose again on the third day. We love you and thank you for everything in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. One last announcement, getting your church on on Wednesday night does not absolve you from being in church on Saturday or Sunday. So God bless everybody. Have a great evening. Um, Frank, you all going out front and I'll, I'll, Thanks, I'll hang brother. out here. God bless everybody. Be safe going home. <laughs>